Well, let me ask you to turn back to the book of Ruth to begin with this afternoon, the book of Ruth. I want to think with you in terms of new morning mercies, which is essentially trying to gain a better understanding of some of the Old Testament terminology that we read not only in Ruth this morning, but we read as well in Psalm number 89. First occurrence in Ruth is down in verse number 8 of the first chapter. This is Ruth chapter number 1 and down in verse number 8 it says, And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house, the Lord deal kindly, that's the word, deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. Over in chapter number two, there's three of these, over in chapter number two, down in verse number 20, right near the end of chapter number two, verse number 20, and Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his, and here's the word, his kindness to the living and to the dead. Kindness. Chapter 3 now in verse number 10. Chapter 3 in verse number 10. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning in as much as thou followest not young men whether poor or rich uh, this word kindness is a word that is translated mercy in the old testament it's translated kindness as we have seen it's translated loving kindness and it's translated goodness it's a Hebrew word that combines the warmth of God's fellowship with the security of God's faithfulness. The warmth, the loving kindness, the warmth of God's fellowship combined together with the security of God's faithfulness. It's translated in terms of love in Exodus and in Deuteronomy. Here, obviously, we have ideas of acting with kindness. Uh, God's covenant love toward his people is his loving kindness. Uh, this word has to do with a sacrificial and a committed and a focused love. New Testament talks about it in terms of God commending his love toward us in John 3, 16. 1 John 4 talks about it. In the Old Testament, it has more to do with a covenant love. It has to do with God's gracious providential care of his people in accord with his pledge to them. It's the warmth of God's fellowship. It's the security of God's faithfulness combined. It is God's gracious providential care of his people in accord with his covenant pledge. As we saw in Ruth this morning, it also has to do with God's personal interest, God's personal interest in and involvement with his loved ones. So think in these terms, when you think of mercy and loving kindness and goodness, it combines the warmth of God's fellowship with the security of God's faithfulness, warmth and security. It's God's gracious providential care of his people in accord with his covenant pledge. And it is, and most helpful to us, it is God's personal interest in and involvement with his loved ones. You saw it this morning in the book of Ruth. Uh, you see it in the story of Abraham and Sarah. Uh, you do hear it much, and I do it here much in the Psalms. It's really one of the most important words in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, I was so thrilled this morning. We had uh, some neighbors that surprised us and came to church this morning. Uh, I was sat there having recognized them in the back as our men were singing, and I just sat and gloried in the things that they heard. They heard uh, you sing of this. They heard uh, the duet sing of this. Um, many people, I believe, that we come in contact with do not have a view of God or an understanding of God in terms of his loving kindness. 
And this word is used not only in uh, reference to God, but it's used in reference to God's people. Our God is a God of loving kindness, and we are never more godlike than when we are people of loving kindness. Now, put those two things together in your mind and allow the Lord to use that to wash over your soul and my soul. When we're talking about Jehovah God and his loving kindness, his mercy, his goodness, we're talking about the warmth of fellowship with him. The warmth of fellowship with him and the security of his faithfulness. We're talking about his gracious providential care of his people in accord with his covenant pledge and his personal interest in and involvement with his loved ones. I think maybe the best combination of words uh, to describe loving kindness would be steadfast love. Steadfast love. The word occurs 28 in 28 of the 39 Old Testament books. And so you understand it's a very important word. Uh, I would suggest it is the Old Testament equivalent for the word grace in the New Testament. It is a loyal, steadfast love. It's a key term that describes an attribute of who God is. More than that, it is the nature of God. It's not my nature. It's not your nature. But it is God's nature. So when I think about the transforming work that God wants to do in my life and the testimony that I need to have and you need to have in every relationship, I think in terms of this loyal, steadfast love of God, the nature of God in relating to his covenant people, mercy, kindness, loving kindness, goodness, loyal, steadfast love. Now, when you find this word in the Old Testament, and that was my intent this afternoon, is do a little bit of a, um, a word study out loud, not turning to all the references, but try to get these things somewhat in our minds. There's four different ways in which this is used in the Old Testament. The first is specific action of one person for another. So loving kindness, mercy is a specific act of one person for another. I think you heard it in the three references I read again from Ruth. So loving kindness is specific action of one person for another. Loving kindness, secondly, is used in the Old Testament for a, con a, a continuing behavior between persons. Not only a specific action of one person for another, but this continuing behavior between persons, a loving kindness, a, a mercy, a goodness that continues between two persons. The third way it's used is the actions of individuals or Israel toward God. Now, we're, we're looking at Old Testament words, so you understand at times it talks about individuals loving kindness toward God, and at times it's talking about Israel as a whole, the nation's loving kindness toward God. In fact, it talks about their failure to have this for God. Because God has this covenant love because of his own character toward his people. But God's people are not always marked by loving kindness toward him. God would say to us, I'd rather you not sacrifice if you don't love me. I'd rather you not sacrifice. So specific actions of one person for another or continuing behavior between persons or the actions of individuals or Israel toward God. The fourth way it's used and probably the, the fundamental foundational way for all the rest is God's actions toward individuals or toward Israel. God's actions toward individuals or toward Israel. Old Testament. Specific actions of one person for another, act of loving kindness toward you or your act of loving kindness toward me. Secondly, th this idea of a continuing behavior between persons, a continuing loving kindness that is shared, a warmness, a warmness, a fellowship, a security, a faithfulness, a loyalty between two persons. Who do you think of? David and Jonathan. David and Jonathan immediately to me. And that's exactly how the word is used. A relationship of David and Jonathan. Thirdly, the actions of individuals are Israel toward God. A loving kindness toward God. A warmth of covenant fellowship with God. And then God's actions towards individuals or towards his people, Israel. 
So let's think through those four one more time. Specific actions of one person for another, and you saw that, is to do something for someone. <laughs> to do or to make. And loving kindness is something that's done. A steadfast, loyal love is something that is active. It's a concrete action. It's performed for another's benefit. So when Ruth chooses to minister to Naomi, it is a ministry of loving kindness. She does specific things for her. When Boaz takes note of Ruth and specifically commands those that serve him to do things for her, that is an act of loving kindness. It's an act of love, an act of mercy. It's performed for somebody else's benefit. It's something that we do for someone else's benefit, an act of love, an act of mercy, an act of righteousness. In 2 Chronicles 32, 32, it says, Hezekiah was remembered for his deeds of loving kindness. Interesting king to study out. You watch him and you recognize he did things, took concrete action for the people that he was responsible for. He performed what he did for the benefit of those under his care. They were deeds and acts of loving kindness. And Hosea, striking book because that prophet is so involved in the book himself. And there's absolutely nothing in Gomer that desires what Hosea did for her. And that book magnifies the loving kindness of Hosea because it's a book that the prophet is magnifying the loving kindness of God. That is a testimony of this first one, specific actions of one person for another. She bought, he bought Gomer back. And you're thinking, how unheard of is that? Well, how unheard of it is for God to buy us back. How unheard of it is for God to welcome us back when we're unloyal to him. We're guilty of spiritual infidelity, whether it be coldness and complacency or whether it be outright sin against God. His loving kindness, specific actions of one person for another, something that is done, something that's performed for another's benefit. So when you and I are drawing close to the Lord, when you and I are walking with the Lord, our lives will be marked by loving kindness. So when I look in the mirror of my soul, when I, when I take my soul and put it in the mirror and honestly behold in the mirror what my life is saying, it is either saying you are godlike in your loving kindness or you are failing to be godlike in your loving kindness. And if I don't know him, and I don't know his loving kindness, I will not ever reflect his loving kindness. If I don't review what he's done for me, I will not be motivated to do acts of loving kindness for other people. I will not be sensitive to that because I will live unaware of that. Specific actions of one person for another. The second I gave you was a continuing behavior between persons. Let me give you two words that I think will help us here, and that is compassionate patterns. Compassionate patterns. Uh, loyalty, faithful conduct. Acting with loyalty toward other people. That would certainly have to do with how we're thinking about them. Are we critiquing and criticizing? Are we measuring up other people? then we're failing that loving kindness. Compassionate patterns, this loyalty, this faithful thinking and faithful conduct toward others, a continuing behavior between persons. This was a word that was used between Jacob and Joseph regarding the burial of Jacob's bones. He, he was arguing for compassion from his son in that regards. It's a word that's used in Joshua about the spies with Rahab. Rahab communicated a compassion when she protected them and they communicated compassion back when they saw the scarlet and they, she was protected. Proverbs uses it in 1922 as a personal loyalty. Continuing behavior between persons, I would suggest to you this afternoon that in a world of continual reactions, 
toward one another. We need to learn loving kindness again. I believe our God is grieved by Christians and they're picking up with the world's ideas, spending our lives reaction, reacting to other people. This is the opposite of that. This is continuing behavior between parties. It has to do with personal loyalty that guards against broken, fractured relationships. It is something that motivates us to seek the resolution of those relationships. If I am satisfied to live in something broken that I'm responsible for and fractured that I'm responsible for, and I will not take, make effort to mend that relationship, then I'm failing at loving kindness. If I'm married to this woman and stood almost 40 years ago in front of people and told them she's the one and I will love her and I will cherish her and I will care for her. And she says he's the one and I will follow him and I will help him and I will be with him as the, the Ruth text says that that is the loving kindness that this second one's talking about. It is a continuing behavior between persons. I have no option not to live that. But I do not do that begrudgingly this afternoon, to be clear with you. And she does not do that begrudgingly this afternoon. And if we did, there is that ungodlikeness in our lives who are, if we're willing to do that. Continuing behavior between persons, other relationships that are broken because of reaction. We're prickly people. We live in a prickly world. You say what I want you to say. You act like I want you to act. I'll be your friend. Completely lost is this idea of a commitment and loyalty and devotion that says, no, you say to me what I'd rather not hear. I'll still be your friend. You fail me. Now think about it. You fail God, what does he do? He kicks you to the curb, right? Then you don't know God. No, he doesn't. But we'll do that to other people. And think we're God-like. We're not God-like. When we fail in our loyalty and when we live in reaction Specific actions of one person for another, continuing behavior between persons. Thirdly, the actions of individuals or Israel or people, we could say, toward God. Hosea 401 talks about Israel's lack of faithfulness to Jehovah using this word. It's a covenant fidelity. Hosea 6.6 6 is something that's held above Sacrifice, as far as God's concerned. God says, I'd rather have your covenant fidelity than to smell any more of your sacrifices. The actions of individuals or Israel toward God, our relationship with him is to be one of loving kindness. A warm, warm fellowship. Secure faithfulness. And then lastly, God's actions towards individuals or Israel. That's really the very essence of who God is. I'd ask you to turn with me for just a moment to Lamentations chapter number 3. Lamentations chapter number 3. We have to check our hearts with these things. This is biblical truth. We're saved to be transformed, to reflect our God, to be God-like in the way that we live. And then Jeremiah understood something of this. Jeremiah had a very difficult ministry. Well, he dealt with a very difficult people. And God told him in advance, you're going to have a very difficult life. You're going to be called to tell people things they're not going to listen to. I want you to tell them anyway. The weeping prophet, lamenting. And he goes through a number of things. In chapter number three, he talks about how difficult his life is. It's a very personal passage. Lamentations chapter 3 says, I'm the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me he has turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin hath he made old. He hath broken my bones. He hath builded 
against me and compassed me with gall and travail. Verse 6, he has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. Also when I cry and shout, he shutteth up my prayer. He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He hath made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. He hath bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. He hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. I was in derision to all my people and their song all the day. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. That's the lament. Listen as he turns and begins to express his faith. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. First part of that testimony is rather difficult, isn't it? He doesn't stay there, does he? He doesn't stay there. He turns in faith and hope toward the Lord and gives testimony to the fact that the Lord's mercies are new every morning and they can be new for us every morning. And if you're locked down in a place where this warmth is not part of your life, you're missing out. If you live in criticism and measuring of other people, you're missing out. If the idea of God being anything other than a God of mercy is what is in your mind and you think you're now acting like God while you're being unmerciful, you're wrong. You're wrong. That's not who God is. And his testimony gets damaged instead of being magnified. So this loving kindness, I think, being such an important concept in the Old Testament must also be... A concept that's very important to us. Folks, loving kindness is shaped right here in your own character. Loving kindness is not conditional. It's character. You heard when it talked about the Lord's loving kindness is based upon his character, upon his covenant promise, upon who he is. It's established within one's spiritual Character. If I am not a person growing in loving kindness, I have a spiritual problem. Doesn't matter how much Bible I know. Doesn't matter how firm my stand is, how great my convictions are. I'm not like God. Because this is an issue of spiritual character. It's established within one's spiritual character. Secondly, it's tested. It's tested throughout the various situations of life. I'm not always marked by loving kindness toward my wife. And she would tell you she's not always marked by loving kindness toward me. But having the spirit of God in our lives and desiring to live for him when these tests come with these various situations, there is a revived determination a rejection of living for self, defending self, and reacting to our mates. And a commitment to love, to be merciful. Established within one's spiritual character. Secondly, tested throughout the various situations of life time and time again. 
as we talk to people, as we should, as we listen to people and listen to what they're struggling with, and we should. I'm a shepherd. That's what I'm here for. But I try time and time again to help them understand the biggest issue at hand is what this is showing you about yourself. You're locked down and you're mad and you're envious and you're bitter because of something somebody else won't do. But you're locked down because of something you won't do. And that's repent before God and saying, God, I am not like you in this. And I desperately want to be like you in this. The situations of life test our loving kindness. Loyal friendships are tested in various situations of life. And our prayer is that we'll pass the test. We'll pass the test. Well, well I deserve. Hold on. Did you read with me Lamentations? You deserve to be consumed. I deserve to be consumed. But if because of God's loving kindness that we're not consumed. Every morning we wake up to new mercy. Do people in our circle wake up to new mercy from us every day? They should. Established within one spiritual character. Secondly, tested throughout the various situations of life. And thirdly, proven. Proven when there exists no reason. <laughs> And say, what do you mean? Well, I'm attempting some application. And I think loving kindness from what I understand in reading these things is proven when there exists no reason, which means the loving kindness is there when the people don't deserve it. The loving kindness is proven when there exists no reason. No reason God should be merciful to us. No reason we should be extending loving kindness toward other people when you start measuring the circumstance and situation. It's proven when there exists no reason. 